In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It's good to see you. Despite this terrible weather, you guys deserve a prize, every and each one of you. I don't know what can I give you other than I'll tell you God bless you for making it through this weather. Today we're going to start a new Bible study of the book of Nehemiah. And um, what we're going to focus on is something very, very, very important in this book. Not necessarily studying uh, every, every, everything in the book, but mainly focusing on leadership, okay? And today we're going to talk about the essentials of a leader and how if there is the best book about leadership in this world, it's in this book, the book of Nehemiah, okay? And I promise you, every, every time I read this book, I get new inspirations about leadership. And... God only knows our need these days for leadership. It's the problem of the world. It's the problem of America. It's the problem of the Middle East. It's the problem of the church. It's the problem of every household leadership, I promise you. Why? Because there is no leadership, no vision, no direction. People are lost. Everything, that's, that's actually a fact, Everything falls on leadership, success or failure. Huge need for leadership. Every single house needs it, every single Christian, because every single Christian is supposed to be a leader. And every day you hear stories about uh, leadership breakdown, leaders falling, doing very uh, unwise mistakes and, 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 and falling from grace. At this time, God is always looking for a leader to accomplish and to do his will on earth, to carry out his mission all over the world. Questions we have, are, leader, are leaders made or born? Are they born leaders or are they made or in between? That's a good question. Am I a leader? Am I supposed to be a leader? Am I doing my job as a leader or not? Does God expect me to be a leader or not? And how to be a good leader? So all these questions, what we're going to talk about during this, uh, this study in the book of Nehemiah. The amazing thing here in the book of Nehemiah that God is using an ordinary person, someone who is a normal, a regular, an ordinary person who has a job, nine to five, or maybe, uh, you know, more stressful work, and God is using him to do something great. Nehemiah was not a prophet. He was not a priest. He was not a Levi. He was an ordinary guy who's got a job, nine to five. Nehemiah was the cupbearer of the king of Persia, cupbearer of the king of Persia. And we're going to explain what's the cupbearer of the king of Persia. And God using, used him to do something historic. And of course, that's why he came in the Bible, to build the walls of Jerusalem. And to build it actually in a record time that you will never believe uh, uh, how it was built in such a time. The leaders are the tunnels, that takes or that, that, that let the power of God uh, flows to people. The leaders, again, they are the tunnels that allow the power of God goes to leaders. And God wants to use them to be these tunnels. And God wants to use us to be these tunnels to transfer the power of God uh, to, to different people. So the question, am I that tunnel or not? And am I ready to be that tunnel or not? What does it take for me to be ready to be that person? Fact, book of Nehemiah, not a single miracle happened there. Not a single miracle happened there, okay? The biggest miracle is God sending the right person for 
the right mission at the right time. That is the miracle. The miracle is not the walls going up by themselves. The miracle is not that there is something supernatural is accomplished. The miracle is God sending you to the right mission at the right place and that you know that this is your mission and that this is your call. The miracle is that you know what God is calling you to, to do at the right time and you taking action and you doing what God wants you to do. That is the real miracle. That's how God used people. We had Pope Krollus, the Pope 116. He was a man of miracle, supernatural thing. Pope Shenouda is the man who did the biggest miracle of building people coming, doing the right thing at the right time, where people needed education, where people needed to be lifted up spiritually and, and knowledge-wise and, 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 and opening the tunnels of knowledge into, into the church. The miracle is the right person coming at the right time to do the right job with the power of God and the help of God. That's the real miracle, and this is the miracle of Nehemiah. Where is Nehemiah in the Bible? Started from creation. You know Adam, Adam and Eve. You know them very well. You know, they were good people. And, you know, later on, you know, Noah came after that because the flood and God made a new covenant with Noah. So we're going Adam, then Noah. And after that, God made a covenant with Abraham, his children, Isaac and Jacob. Abraham was about 2,000 years before Christ. God made a covenant with him from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Israel became the children of Israel. They were in Egypt, came out of Egypt, became people, became congregation, crossed the Red Sea, the wilderness, 40 years. You know, Moses led them through this. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, which is Israel, congregation. Moses brought them. So we know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses took them. Joshua gave them the land. So we're going in order, all of this. And then after Joshua, who gave them the promised land, some judges came, judges like saviors, people coming at the right time to help God's people, like Samson, Gideon. These people came to, you know, to save people from their own sins and problems. Children of Israel go astray. A judge come. A judge comes, and then he saves the people, bring them back to, to God. After judges, the last judge is Samuel. He's a prophet, and um, uh, 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 he was the last judge. And then God, the people of Israel said, we don't want a judge. We don't want a man of God. We want a king like the rest of the people. So they chose the first king, which is Saul. That was the first king of Israel or Judah or the children of God. He was not, you know, a good man. And then David came according to God's choice, and he made the kingdom of Israel the strongest kingdom. During his son Solomon, the, the temple was built, and, and these were the two strongest kings, David and Solomon, his son. After that, things started to go south. Kingdom of Israel split into two, northern and southern. Northern Samaria, southern uh, uh, um, Jerusalem. Ten tribes up, two tribes down, uh, Judah and Benjamin in Jerusalem, and the ten. Northern people went off. All their kings were bad, you know, and, and the book of, of, of uh, uh, um, the kings and, the, and the, uh, first and second kings and chronicles tells you, king of Israel, king of Judah, king of Israel, king of Judah. All of king of Israel's were bad. All of them were corrupt. King of The kings of Israel... Some good, some bad. In the end, the southern kingdom also messed up. So God said, punishment time. After sending so many prophets, you repent or the exile is coming. Finally, the exile came. Exile is uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king. He took, uh, he came and he took all the good people uh, from Jerusalem, destroyed the city completely, destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls, actually over, you know, two trips. <clears throat> so Jerusalem is destroyed. Only the weak people were there. 
all the unique people or the good people, all the smart people were in exile, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, Ezekiel. All these people were in the in exile in Babylon. Later on, it was called Persia, but you know, the kingdom of Babylon and Persia. Nehemiah was born in the exile. Okay? God, after 70 years of exile, brought back the children of Israel, but not all of them came back. Some of them, you know, stayed uh, in, in, in Babylon, and they came, you know, in, in three trips. The first, the second was Ezra, the third was Nehemiah. Anyways, people started coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. Started rebuilding the temple, some of the houses, the walls of Jerusalem was broken down. And it was done for a political reasons that it's easy to get the city. It's easy to attack the city if you want to attack. The walls was the most important thing in the city to protect the city. You have good walls, your walls are up, nobody can approach you. You will be the strongest city ever. And for you to understand how big the walls were, the walls were not just bricks on top of each other, they were a building. Meaning, the wall could be from here to over there, and it's a building, and it goes all around the city. To a point that on top of the wall, inside the wall, people, people live inside the wall. Like who lived in the wall of Jericho? Rahab. Okay, she lived actually in the wall, because the wall was a building. On top of the wall, it's like a road. You can drive a car on top of the wall and go around the city. That's how the soldiers stand and defend the city. You understand? So the walls were not just walls. It's a big, huge building, high, strong, can um, protect the city from anything. Walls of Jerusalem was broken down, and there was no way to be built up again because it's a huge building. Imagine that building all around the city. And every time the Jews try to build... The enemies come and they say, we don't want this city. This city was a source of, 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 of problems all over history. We don't want the city to be built whatsoever. These people, they have God. They're powerful. They're strong. They couldn't build the walls for so long until Mr. Nehemiah came to action. So let's open the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, and see where he comes in this dilemma. Okay, so Nehemiah chapter 1, let's read just the first four verses, says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Shizl, that the twelfth year, as I was in Shoshan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress or misery and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Again, Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king of Persia. What's the king of Persia? It's Mr. Obama. It's the White House. It's the Oval Office. He was the king of the world, basically. Babylon took over, Persia took over. So Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the most influential man on earth back then. What's the cupbearer? It seems like a waiter or something like this. It's not. Cupbearer means he gives the wine and the drinks and the food to the king. And this was a very special position given to people that the, the king trusts blindly. Why? Because the way to kill kings back then was not by elections. It was by putting poison in their food and in their drinks. Okay? So they can 
um, bribe the people who are giving them the food and drink, put some poison, that's most of the king's, you know, um, uh, um, uh, died or were killed. So the cupbearer, someone who tastes the drink, who can give his life on behalf of the king. And usually when the king drinks, what comes out? All the secrets, all, you know, the stuff that doesn't want to share. He's the one when he sees the king drunk, opens the room for him, please get inside. He closed the door for him, you know, just be quiet now, don't make any decisions because you're drunk. Or he makes sure that the king is not drunk. So he's someone very, very, very trustworthy. He has all the secrets of the king. He is extremely powerful. Because if the king is drunk, you can get anything. You can get anything done. You can get away with anything. So people may bribe him to do anything while the king is not 100% sober. But he was an honest guy. He was a good guy. Very, very good position. Very prestigious. But he cared about his people back home in Jerusalem. So when one of his brothers came back from Jerusalem, he said, how are people there? He said, people are in great distress. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned with fire. The situation is horrible. Oh, thank God, I'm here. Luxury, I have my AC on. I have my bed. I have my luxury. I have my salary. He didn't do that. He prayed, he cried, and he fasted for many days. Specifically, there were about four months of prayer and fasting and crying before God. Why? Because of the first reason of a leader is that the leader has a clear recognition of the needs. A leader, number one, first essential of a leader that has a clear recognition of the needs. He doesn't have, it's not my problem. He's not a person who sees the problem and he pretends that he didn't see anything. He doesn't pass by people or problems or something that's going on as he didn't see it. No. He has something that catches these things and say, what am I supposed to do? What is my role here? He's not a man who says, who did it? Who burned the walls? Whose responsibility? Whose fault is this? He doesn't ask these questions. He asks the most important question is, what is the need and why must, what is my responsibility? He can recognize the need. That's how you become a leader. When you're high level, usually you don't recognize people, normal people, regular people, their problems. I don't know whose queen is this famous queen in Europe. Maybe people with good history background can tell me. But people came to the palace crying to the king and queen, we don't have no bread to eat. We don't have any bread to eat. And she said, what's your problem? Eat cakes. You don't have cakes? Just eat anything. Well, lady, we don't have bread. We have nothing. We're poor. She doesn't know what's going on. Usually, that's the case in many levels. Especially when you're a person who avoids confrontations and problems. I don't want to deal with problems. Tell me the good things. Tell me the fun things. Don't tell me problems. What am I going to do with problems? A father who cannot relate to his children. What their problems? What are they facing at school? What their problems with their friends? A servant who is in the la, la land, who knows the Bible, but he doesn't know what people are going through. He can preach and he can tell people what they should do, but he doesn't know what people really face. He doesn't know the need of people. What is the biggest need at your house, in your household, in your home? What is the biggest need of the church? What is it? Is it spiritual? Is it financial? What is, the pro what is the problem of America? Do we know? Do we recognize the need around us? What is the need in our community? Are we aware of that? 
The leader is someone who has a clear recognition of the needs, wherever he is, whatever passes by him. Second, the leader is personally concerned with the need. Personally concerned with the need. Nehemiah was called to build a wall, but first he wept over the ruins of the walls. Very important. Before I do something, I have to be personally concerned about that. He wept, he cried, he fasted. When do I usually fast? And usually it's three days when I need to make the biggest decision in my life and I have the biggest trauma in my life. I rarely fast three days and hopefully, you know, that's, that's the end of it. Just for my personal severe problem, this man fasted four months for his people. Back home, far away, weak, farmers, whatever. He could have said, is their problem? They're lazy. But he was personally concerned about them. Very scary in the Bible. Very scary in the Bible that every time I read this story, this story I, I really get scared, is the story of Eli, the priest and his children. And I'm just going to read you some verses from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 11. Sam, Eli was that priest back then, he had two sons who were priests also, but they were wicked. They were so wicked. They did so many bad things with the children of God. Eli knew about it. He was warned by God. He didn't take a single action. It says here, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel is the little kid, the new prophet who's coming to purge away the sins of Eli and his children. Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears will tingle. In that day, I will perform against Eli and all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. If you have your Bible, under, underline he knows. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. This man didn't care even about his own children, who are destroying the people of God, who are his responsibility. You can reach a point when you don't care about anything, even if it's at your own household, even if it's very, very, very close. Where did this come from? Carelessness, that's my problem. I don't want to deal with problems. Don't tell me any problems. He doesn't want to deal with problems. He doesn't want any confrontation. But the leader is concerned with the need. I got to do something about it. Every single father has a responsibility concerning his household and his children. And when the fathers and when the parents say it's the responsibility of the church, it's the end of the story. And no wonder we get the worst kids ever here at church. Why? Because their parents assume that it's the church's responsibility to raise them. It's not. It's home responsibility. A church can guide home to raise. But if, if you leave this, if you're not concerned about that, if you don't fast and pray about your own children and your kids, no one will. No one will. The leader has a clear recognition of the need. He's personally concerned about the need. And number three, a serious leader goes first to God with the problem. Because definitely way bigger than him. How can you solve a relational problem? Especially a relational problem. You got a problem with your kids, with your parents, with your spouse, your boss. How do we usually take care of this? We blame, we judge, we talk, we talk to everyone about this problem. 
before we talk with God. And before we talk to God for a long time about this. And before putting this before God. So this is the prayer of Nehemiah. Once he received this, he fasted, he prayed, as I said. And this here, his beautiful, beautiful, beautiful prayer. In verse 5 he says, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keeps your covenant and and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Familiar with this? Liturgy. We say this in the liturgy. I pray, God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and, and observe your commandments. How does he start? Praising God. Not complaining, praising God. That's the way to start the prayers. Thanksgiving, praising God. Starts with praise always. And then in verse 6, he says, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Start with praise. Second, repentance. That's how we deal with problems. That is the prayer, not just the Agbeya prayer of the hours, but it is the prayer about problems, big things. Praising to God, maker of heaven and earth, who's able to do everything and beyond our imagination, to know who we are talking to. And second, I confess my sins. I promise you, in every relational problem, if you start by confessing and admitting your sins first, at least to God, then great things will come. Family problem, friend problem, stuff like this. Who starts the prayer by confessing and admitting his sins first? This is the key. This is, this is the leader. This is someone who goes to God first with everything, with the problems, with the sins, with everything. God, it is in your hands. You you are the master, you are the Lord, you're everything. And I put this before you in prayer. And then he says in verse 8, so started with praise. Second is huh? confession of sins. Number 8 is reminding God with his promises. Tells you how familiar he is with the scripture. He says, remember... Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. He's quoting, actually, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 30. You can find this in, your, uh, in, in the side notes. So he, someone who knows the scripture. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, Yet I will gather them from there. I bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling from my name. God is saying, if you sin, I will scatter you. If you repent, I'll bring you back to this place that I chosen for my dwelling, which is the temple, which is Jerusalem. You said if we said sin, you will scatter us, but you will bring us back. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desires to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. You promised you would bring us back. You said you will do it. Now, I demand that you Fulfill your promises. We are repenting. I'm repenting before you. I'm standing in the gap. I am instead of your people. Would you accept my prayer and my fasting on their behalf? We all sinned. Guess who said we all sinned? It's the most righteous person. Someone in the palace. 
Why does he need the Word of God? Why does he need the Scripture? Didn't God scatter them in the end of the world? Why Daniel and Nehemiah and the three saintly youth have to keep this? Didn't you, God, throw us away? Let's live as these people live. Didn't you cast us out of your presence? Let's live our life. No. We repent. And I repent on behalf of these people. It's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing. Someone is standing in the game, taking responsibility. I am responsible. I fast on their behalf. These are my faults. These are our faults. These are our mistakes. But you are a good God. You didn't stop right there. He said, you are merciful. And you promised. You keep your promise. And you will do that. I'm waiting on that. So a leader is someone who recognizes clearly the need, who is concerned personally about the need. He is someone who takes things first to God, and number four and last, is available to meet the need himself. Not only I pray, I pray, I pray, but in the end of the prayer, grant him, your servant, me, mercy in the sight of this man, which is the king. Please grant me mercy before the king. Why? What are you supposed to do with the king? I'm going to tell him the problem. I'm going to tell him my responsibility. I'm going to tell him everything. Why? Didn't these kings, aren't these kings the ones who brought the children of Israel? Isn't Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the one who, this is his successor, who one who did order the exile. Aren't these kings are, are the ones who destroyed the walls in the temple? You expect them to rebuild it? I don't know. I think this is the only and the one and only time he used his power and his position. In his mind, God brought me here in this job, in this time, in this place for this, exactly like Esther. This is the time. I am here for this time. I'm in this position for this time. I got my school studies for this time. I got my experience for, for this particular time. Give me mercy before the king. He didn't say, I'll pray for the people. May God do a miracle. May, God, may you help them somehow. He said, no, grant me mercy. I'm here. I'm willing to do anything. But you give me mercy before the king. In a conclusion, the leaders or the leader is the person that God can use in a specific times, specific situations. He can rely on him. Someone who can get the vision of God. He can get the signals of God. Someone who has care, concern about others. The leader, in one word, someone cares about others. Not someone in a position. As I told you, Nehemiah was not a king. He was not a prophet. He was not a priest. But he was a caring person. And he cared not just for his people, but for these things that belongs to God. The things that pertains to God and to his people. And God used him in, in, in such an amazing way. He was clearly able to determine to see the need. And I challenge you, this is the one homework that I see that I said before you this week. Are you able to recognize the need? I'll, I'll give you the, the selfishness test. I'm not sure if I said that before. Selfishness test is write five names of people that you deal with more than once a week. Brothers, sisters, siblings, you know, co-workers, people that you deal with more than once a week. You see them, you deal with them more than once a week. Five people. And write down all their problems, their challenges in life. What are they facing? Financial? Health-wise, what are they facing? What are their problems? 
this is just an exercise first will make you for the first time to think about things that you've never thought about. And it will make you ask you a question. Oh, you told me a long time ago that you had this kind of disease or problem. How is this? Oh, you still remember? Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's here and there. I'm still taking medications. Wow, you're taking these medications every day? Yeah, it's upsetting my stomach and it's giving me this and that and the kids. and the... Oh, my goodness. All these are things in your life and I'm dealing with you more than once a week and I'm not aware of because I pass by these things. It's the selfishness factor. Okay? I'm just telling you the five people are close, you know, to you. But more than that, what is the need of my church, my household, my community, my country? Do I recognize that? Because that's how God will use me, you know, to recognize the need, to personally care about the need, to take this sincerely and seriously before God and to be willing to take an action. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand up for prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your words and the wisdom in your words, Lord. We know that there is a big demand, Lord, for, for leaders and for leadership these days. Pray, Lord, that you can use us, Lord, that you change us, Lord, to your image, that, that we be become like you, Lord. You are the Father of all. You're the Pantocrator. You're the one who cares for everyone. And you are the one who fulfills the need of every living creature. Give us your heart, Lord, to care, to care to see, and to care to pray, and to care to take action, Lord, around us. Take away, Lord, the spirit of, of apathy from our hearts, Lord. Give us, Lord, to be sincerely concerned for, for, for the things that concerns you, Lord, for your people, for your ch children, Lord, for your church. And, and, and give us to be ready, Lord, and good vessels to be ready to, to receive your, your, your Holy Spirit, Lord, and to, to act the, the actions and the missions, Lord, that you have put in, in, in for us, Lord, before the beginning of the world. We thank you, praise you, glorify Pray this in the name of our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the intercession of Holy Mother, St. Mary, St. Mark, all your saints, hear us and pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, so we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil one. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for in the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As the conclusion of the Bible study and the servants' meeting is right now.